Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Rougarou Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Polina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 267 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as ever, by my main man himself. It is, of course, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, welcome back on the show. How are you, my man? I'm good, bro. How are you feeling? All good, man. Always great when speaking with you. Um, before we get into everything, I just want to explain the format of the podcast this week. We're going to do the review part, then we're going to do the news, then we're going to bring in our sole guest, which will be former WBA uh, world champion Andrew Maloney, the guy that really and truly a lot of people think should be a world champion right now, but he, he was on the wrong end of a uh, crazy uh, video referee decision in Vegas, obviously, um, what was it, almost two weeks ago. So I'll be speaking to him a bit later on in the show. He's our sole guest, and then after that, we'll do the preview part, and then I'll sign out with the outro. But um, yeah, with with no further ado, let's get into the review part. We're going to start here at the Ocean Center in Daytona Beach, Florida, USA. Returned to the ring after six years for Tavoris Cloud. Like I say, he came back with a with a bang, I guess, 25-3 and three now, a TKO win for him in three rounds against Ryan Soft, who's now 4-12 and 12 with a draw. Um, moving out now to Quebec, Canada. Over here, we got to see Yves Ulysse Jr. Um, he was back with a win. He's now 19-2, and two, um, a TKO for him in seven rounds against Mattel Germain, who's now 18-2 and two with a draw. That one was for the vacant NABF super lightweight title. And Yves Ulysse, his um, kind of nemesis, I guess, or whatever you want to call him, his, his rival Steve Claggett was on the undercard. He came back with a win as well against his opponent. Uh, so perhaps a collision course for a rematch there we shall see moving out now to the Wembley Arena in London United Kingdom let's start with the undercard uh, Jez Smith he was in there against Ben Ridings Ben Ridings 3-0 Jez Smith 11-2 and with a draw going in um it was a tough fight for Ben Ridings, man. He lost every round, according to the one sole judge, which was the referee, uh, Bob Williams. So, um, yeah, very good win for Jez Smith. He was a big underdog as well with you know with the bookmakers and stuff. So, um, yeah, money to be made there. And Jez Smith, you know, he'd operated at a much higher level, so that's a great win for him. He hasn't had it easy in his career at all at any point, so I'm really pleased for him, actually, to, you know, to have a bit of luck or whatever there. Uh, also on the card, moving up again, we go to Liam Davies. He picked up a win, um, an eighth, uh, sorry, not eighth. The guy didn't come out for round seven, a retirement on his stool after six rounds. Um, Sean Cairns, I think his name was. It was for the vacant English bantamweight title. So Liam Davies now 8-0. and Also on the card, we got to see Alan the Savage Babich. He's now 6-0. and A TKO in round three against Tom Little, who's now 10-9. and And after the fight, he's decided to retire. Um, which is crazy because, you know, a lot of people wanted to see him take on Dave Allen. They were both heavyweights that in a lot of people's eyes, weren't particularly world beaters, and they had a lot of banter outside of the ring, and it was a fight I would have loved to see, but both guys have retired one week after the other. Uh, Tom Little was down twice in the third round prior to that stoppage, and um, yeah, it was, it was you know, he, he come to give it a go. Um, you know, he seemed like he was trying to kind of tire Babich out by taking all of his shots, and in return he was going to the body of Babich, uh, it was it was very obvious that his game plan was to try and you know come on strong late on uh, and, and try and force a late stoppage. But the problem is he couldn't soak up the punishment. His defense was too leaky, and it proved to be a, a suicidal game plan in the end because he was just exhausted himself from taking all those shots. And like I say, down twice in the final round. 
Um, and I actually writ here in my notes, he should perhaps look at retiring. And as I read it, I thought, Do you know what? That's a little bit harsh. And then he did end up retiring. So crazy. Um, also on the card, Fabio Wardley moved to double figure wins. He's 10 and 0 now. He's looking like a good prospect because he got Richard Larty out of there in just two rounds. Um, Richard Larty was in all sorts of trouble when he was on the floor. Uh, some people saying he was over exaggerating. I'm not sure, man. It was weird. But anyway, he's now 14 and 4. Uh, Fabio Wardley gets him out of there quicker than Daniel Dubois could. And also, you know, he beats him in better fashion than Nathan Gorman, who went points with him. So, um,. That's a great win for Fabio Wardley, man. He's closing in on a British title shot up at heavyweight, of course. And the main event, Conor Ben, now 17-0. and A win for him. Very, very impressive win against Sebastian Formella, who's now 22-2. and It was for Conor Ben's WBA Continental Welterweight title. Like I say, unanimous decision over 10 rounds. I was so, so impressed with Conor Ben. You know, he came out firing. Um, he looked very sharp from the off. It was, it was surprising, considering he was coming off a year out the ring, and I've got to be honest, I fancied Formella um, to, to perhaps cause an upset, even you know, based on mainly the fact that he was able to go to distance with 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 Sean Porter, twelve rounds with Sean Porter a few weeks back, a couple months ago, whenever it was, and I don't think. Connor Ben could go the distance with someone like like Sean Porter, in my honest opinion, and also the fact that, like I say, Ben was out the ring for such a long time. This guy was active only a couple months ago. Ben had virtually no amateur career. Formella had about 150 amateur fights, um, and I also felt, you know, on top of all of that, Formella had better wins than Connor Ben, but. Yeah, so impressive from Conor Ben. He completely shut this guy out. His head movement was really impressive to me. He was finding great angles, and his punch repertoire was was very impressive. I feel like he's just improving all the time. And a lot of people, based off that, are now saying, you know what, him against Josh Kelly, that's a pick and fight. That's a 50-50 fight. Whereas if you'd have said this two years ago, no one picked Conor Ben in that fight. And, I mean, he's really... Um, you know, he's got so much momentum now. Uh, it's crazy because you take a year out, you think that the momentum perhaps can um, can slow, you know, out of the ring that long. But no, he's back and he looked he looked brilliant. Moving out now, though, to the Staples Center in Los Angeles, California. One fight to mention, really, on this card here. Um, Javier Fortuna picked up a win. He's now 36-2 and with a draw. A KO for him in round six against Antonio Torres, who's now 40-4 and with a draw. Um, gotta be honest, I didn't actually see that fight at all, and I've flown through the review part really quickly there, so that's it for the reviewing. Um, I want to go on to the news in a sec, but before I get into that, Eddie, I almost forgot the trivia question this week, and I've got to say, it was sent in from very loyal listener Tuba TJ, who I haven't or hadn't heard from. For quite a long time, actually. I hadn't spoke to him probably for about six months. And um, it's great to know he's still listening and stuff like that. He's based out there in Hawaii. And um, he slid in my, my direct messages with with uh, a question for Eddie. He said, hey, Joey, here's an easy-ish question for, for Eddie. And I actually didn't know the answer to this question at all. And I haven't researched it, but I'm, I'm guessing he's he's got it right. But I didn't know it, Eddie, so... I'm not. I mean, your your knowledge is so much more wider than mine. But um, I didn't know it at all. So, yeah, you're you're right to a degree. But is it? If we're talking about boxing technique and boxing issues of of, of my era based. You know, I mean, maybe maybe previously, a little before me, a little a little bit now, maybe. But you got to understand, and this is what even most fight well, a lot of fighters. Some of them were students, and I'm a student of the the art. But as far as the history, I got a little bit of work I need to do. So if if it's something involving that, it's going to always be interesting, but not necessarily always hard. So we'll see. We will see. And here it is. Um, what was special about the trunks <laughs> that George Foreman wore when he regained his title against Michael Mora? Oh. It's a hard question, man. It is a very hard question. It's not, it, you know, and and the thing is, it's about the trunks. Like I get, like, let me think. Uh, Jesus, were the trunks he wore in another special fight? Is that like, 
is that something that because I I honestly that's the only thing I could think of about the trunks. I mean, unless it was they were. In, uh, I don't usually I, I don't was, usually give you clues, but I'm gonna say yeah, you're right. But which fight? I think it was the ones he wore against Ali. Was it? Yes, it was. Or, there you go. I kind of it was the red or red and white ones, right? Do you know what I can't I, I can't was, even remember how poor is that. I, I, but I think it was that. That's the only thing I could think of in that. You know, besides like the style of him was crazy, but I think he would. I don't know if I heard that, but I think I remember him being like red and white or black. I can't remember what the color was. I think it was red and white. I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. But yeah, I kind of. I, I I don't know how I got this W, but I did. <laughs> and 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 it's and it's crazy because. I understand why somebody would do that. You know how fighters and athletes in general are just so superstitious when it comes to things. I don't know about George. I don't know if he is, but to do something like that would kind of like, well, hey, hell, I'm gonna I'm putting myself in a situation where, you know, at least I have the 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 attire that fits for me to be in this in a, in a better position. Like at least, you know, I, he lost the fight to Ali, so I guess not in a sense, but maybe in his best years. You know what I mean when he was younger, but. He actually won, so whatever the charm was, <laughs> it worked. There we are, a win for George Foreman and a win for you, Eddie. Um, so that yeah. that 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 breaks up the losing streak, man. That's that's good. That's good. Okay. Apparently, about that. apparently the shorts themselves were um, were almost as old as Michael Mora. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> That is crazy. When you think about that, that's crazy. He fought somebody as old as his trunks. <laughs> but he, hey, he won. Yeah, man. That's crazy. But yeah, I, I thought that was a difficult one. And I actually said, I actually replied to Tuba TJ. I said, thanks for sending in the, the question. And I'm looking forward to giving Eddie another L. But it was a W, man. So congrats to you, Eddie. Here's my round of applause, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. Hey, man, you know, get, get to give credit where you know when it's due, man, and I, and I appreciate getting it. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> well, there we have it. That's the review part done. That is the question for Eddie done. Moving on now to the news, and if anything else happens from now till the end of the show, I'll talk about it at the very end. Um, what do we have? What do we have? Uh... We know that Canelo against Callum Smith is going to be now taking place at the Alamo Dome in Texas, which, to be honest, most people thought it was going to be there anyway, so no real uh, surprises there, I don't think. Um, Aside from that, we have a return to the ring for Gennady Golovkin. He'll be taking on um, an undefeated Polish fighter by the name of Kamil Serometa, I think his name is. It's going to be at the Hard Rock uh, the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Florida, in Hollywood. Um, so, yeah, that one's on the zone. That's going to be, like I say, Friday, December 18th. And then 24 hours later, we get to see Canelo. So that's a big weekend there for the middleweight division. And also, we get to see on December 12th, the super middleweight sensation, the, the first round KO artist himself, Edgar Balanga. He takes on... Ulysses Sierra, that one's going to be on the, I think it's on the um, Shakur Stevenson undercard, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, yeah, all the best to Edgar Belanga. And like I say, if if any more news develops from now till the end, then I will talk about it right at the end when I'm signing out with the outro. But anyway, that's it for the review part and the news part and Eddie's trivia question. It's now time, before we wrap up part one, to welcome our sole guest on this week's podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former WBA Super Flyweight World Champion. It is, of course, Mr. Andrew Maloney. Andrew, welcome back on the show, my man. Thanks for having me on again, mate. Absolutely, my pleasure, Andrew. Um, I want to start here, Andrew. Obviously, the first things first, you know, we spoke before the first Franco fight. We haven't done an interview since that day, so I'd like to quickly sum the first fight up. I know it's obviously quite, you know, distant now in the past, but in your own words, how did you kind of assess that first encounter with Franco? Um, the first fight, it, it's something that really frustrates me to, to look back on because... It was obviously the first defense of my world title, and um, a few things went wrong in that fight. Uh, sustained a few injuries, which probably you know 
oh, well, they did prevent me from boxing at my best, but it was just a, a really bad performance for myself. And I was really kicking myself afterwards that, that um, you know, people saw such a bad performance for myself and I lost the world title. And a lot of people wrote me off after that fight and thought that, you know, that was the level that I was at and as far as I could go. And I was really determined to, to show everyone in this rematch that I'm a much better fighter than I showed in that first fight. And I trained extremely hard in the, for the five months between the two fights. And I believe in those two, two rounds, you got to see a glimpse that I am a much better fighter. Um, and was on my way, well, dominating the fight and, well, it was a TKO, but I was definitely on my way, whether the the eye was damaged or not, to, to dominating that fight and, and winning my world title back. And again, like we say, after the first fight, and, you know, I'll tell it how it is, I felt in the first fight you were winning the fight um, early on. You started brilliantly. Then, you know, you say you kind of got a couple injuries mid-fight. Then you seem to switch up the tactics and kind of start fighting his fight. You, you neglected the jab. You didn't box. You started to fight with him, and that became your undoing, in my opinion. But after the fight, you know, you go back to Australia. Shortly after that, there's talk that we're going to get the instant rematch. Obviously, you were back in Australia when the fight got made. You then have to travel back to Vegas for the rematch, but because... Uh, you know, Jason was boxing two weeks prior to that. I believe you were there even earlier than you normally would have been. Was that a little bit disruptive to your preparations in any way? And how long were you actually in Australia for in between the two fights? Um, so I was in Australia between the fights for around 10 weeks. Um, and then I came over to America, as you said, with Jason to finish training camp. Um, so we came over six, about six and a half weeks before my fight, um, a month before Jason's and yeah, to be honest, it, it didn't disrupt things at all. It, um, it, it's been hard to be away from my family for so long and to spend so much time away, but having the six weeks in America where I got some really great sparring, um, it finished off, a, a, it was the best training camp of my career. So yeah, it certainly just dis, didn't disrupt things at all. Um, I got no complaints about the training camp and the preparation that I had. And, and as you can see in those two rounds, um, I, I had made some, some, uh, some big improvements between the two fights and I was determined to show that I'm a better fighter than I showed in that first one. And again, another thing, and I'm not trying to make any excuses. You were definitely, you know, doing excellent, excellent in the second one, but obviously, you know, being ringside for, for, for Jason's fight, that's, that's surely got to be something that's a bit difficult to kind of put aside, knowing you're going to be in that same ring just two weeks later. But the, the, the rematch, you know, almost two weeks ago now, you came out, you certainly won the first two rounds. I think everyone would agree with that, even Franco himself. But just talk me through those first two rounds, because I've got to say I was a little bit surprised how aggressive you were. Yeah, well, I was determined to... To, to dominate this fight from start to finish. And um, I knew that Franco was extremely confident this time around. And I believe he he thought he was going to walk straight through me. So I was determined to to start this fight strong and to show him that you know, the, the fighter he's fighting this time around is, is not the same fighter he shared the ring with in the first fight. And to put doubt in his mind straight away. And I believe I did that. Um, I dominated those two rounds and and landed a, a beautiful jab in the first round, which instantly started to close his eye. Um, and I continued to, to, to target that area and um, to shut that eye up and to force the stoppage, which I did. But unfortunately, I wasn't aware that the referee had called the, the damage to be done by a head clash, which I think everyone who's seen the fight can see that there was no head clash. But... That was the referee's call, and I didn't realise that until after the fight had been stopped and I jumped up on the ropes to celebrate and quickly was told that the referee had called a head clash and it was going to be a no contest. And then and then we uh, the instant replay got put into play, which I was very positive about. And, and for the 26 minutes we waited in the ring, I was really confident that they were going to see from the footage that it wasn't from a head clash and the decision was going to be overturned. But 
after 26 minutes of waiting in the ring, um, they they kept with the original decision and called a no contest, which, as you can see from the uproar on social media, um, millions of people around the world didn't see a head clash. And I don't think you can have, you know, everyone can be wrong. I agree 100%. And, you know, you're right. The way you fought in the first couple of rounds, the jab was excellent. You, you, you landed not just one, but a consistent amount of, brilliant jabs right right on that eye of Franco, his right eye. And um, I also liked your left hooks as well to the body, which you sunk in a few times. But yeah, you mentioned when the fight was stopped, you were celebrating in the other corner, believing you'd won by KO. The referee, Russell Mora, rules it a head clash. Uh, just for those that don't understand the ruling, you know, if, if an accidental foul occurs before four completed rounds, you know, it, would, it wouldn't go to the scorecards. It would be ruled a no contest. In Vegas, you mentioned as well, they've got the benefit of having a video referee, which in this case, I believe, was Robert Bird. 27 minutes it took in the ring. Um, what, what just kind of describe for me, Andrew, what it was like, what was going through your head and the rest of your team's heads at that point, being in the ring for that long? with that much uncertainty. I know that they did an interview with Robert Garcia, the trainer of Franco. He thought they were trying to screw his fighter over. You guys didn't know what was going on. <laughs> um, yeah, tell me, what was going through your head in that terrible wait? Well, in that wait, it was it was frustrating that it was taking so long um, because that was a very special moment for me. And I, I believed that I was going to be crowned world champion and have that belt strapped back around my waist. Um, but... While we're waiting, I was I was communicating with the commentary team and and everyone that was watching the instant replays, and all of them were saying the same thing. They're saying there's no head clash. It's from a punch, and I was just becoming more and more confident as the time went on that the decision was going to be overturned in my favour. So I really wasn't too stressed, but um, then when they announced the decision as a no contest, I was just in shock. I just couldn't believe it. Do you feel robbed? Is that how you feel? Absolutely. Absolutely. I um, I can't explain how much I wanted that belt back and just how much hard work I put in and the sacrifices of being away from my family for almost five months this year to to win that world title back. And, and honestly, like between those two, the two fights, that five months, I, I barely slept. So a solid night because I was just thinking about this fight over and over again because I just wanted to win it back so badly. And then to perform how I did and, and dominate the fight and then for them to just take it away from me, it yeah, it's it's been a pretty tough week and I just can't believe it. Yeah, and I can hear the, the, the pain in your voice really, Andrew. Um do you think that Joshua Franco might be one of the luckiest men in the world in 2020? I mean, he was only in the in the fight in the first place because he was thrown in at late notice because your original opponent pulled out. Now he's looking at getting three paydays from what should have been one one night's action, really, and somehow he's still held on to the world title. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so yeah, he got the first fight because um, he had he had notice, but the he was from America, um, and obviously with the travel restrictions, it. Um, it basically limited to me, limited me to fight someone from America in that first fight. So he, um, yeah, he got the opportunity. Um, and look, he he beat me in the first fight. I got no complaints about that. Um, but yes, the the decision um, last weekend, he couldn't be any luckier. Um, there's, as I said, there's millions of people around the world who saw the fight, and I think. Robert Bird might be the only person that, that thought, and uh, and sorry, and Russell Moore, they're probably the two only people in the world that thought it was from a head clash. So he's a he's a lucky man. And obviously, Andrew, you know, being totally honest, we only saw two completed rounds of boxing. Um, anything at all could have happened in those remaining ten rounds. You did start off extremely well in the first one, if we remember. Um, there's 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 every chance that it could have gone the same way, but how? I mean, how sure are you that you could have kept up that pace, that amount of output for the rest of the fight? Because he couldn't breathe the way you were fighting in that first two rounds. I was, I was stunned. You know, you really put it on him. Um, it was quite, it was yeah. quite shocking the tactics, but in a good way. Yeah. Um, well, firstly, the like people have been saying that that I did start well in the first fight and things, but 
But in this fight, the difference was I landed, I think, twice as many punches in the first two rounds. And I busted his eye up in uh, with, in, in one round from punches. So it's uh, basically I stopped him in two rounds uh, if the decision was cool, called correctly. Um, but to answer the question, I could have kept that pace up for 15 rounds. I, I was in the best shape of my life. Um, and the pressure that I put him on him in the second round was due to the fact that I could feel from his body language and just his presence in the ring that he didn't want to be there anymore. So that's why I upped the pace so much in that second round to, to try and get him out of there. Um, but yeah, I had would have had no problem doing that for the 12 rounds. I, I was in the shape of my life and I sparred 12 rounds many times throughout the training camp and, and was not getting one bit tired. I was in, yeah, in great shape. And that's a brilliant answer. And I've read on Twitter, Andrew, that you're, you're looking at launching an appeal regarding the decision. Where are you in terms of doing that at the minute? Yeah, so an appeal, um, the, the lawyer we have involved has, has put in an appeal to the Nevada Commission for them to um, reconsider and, and, and um, change the decision. Um, so we're waiting to hear from them about a, a, a date for a hearing where my lawyer will represent me and our case. Um, so at the moment, it's just a bit of a waiting game. I'm not too sure where it's at at the moment, but um, whatever way that decision goes, whether they overturn it or not, I'm just looking forward to the third fight with, with Joshua Franco now. And um, whether I even, yeah, if I, if I am given the, the belt back, um, which I rightly deserve, I I still want to have this third fight with Franco and to put any doubt at ease and to show that I'm the deserving champion. And just to clarify there, you say that the appeal would be submitted to the Nevada State Athletic Commission, which obviously, as you're aware of, Bob Bennett was ringside for the fight and he pretty much gave his verdict on the night. Uh, I, at first, when I heard this appeal, I thought it perhaps is something you could contest with the sanctioning body, with the WBA, if they had the power to overrule something. But are you, I don't know, how much, how confident are you? The commissioner was there, he had 27 minutes. What, what is he going to see with more time? I'm guessing you're going to probably have to pay a hefty fee for this as well. Is it worth it? Are you confident? It's, it's messy. Uh, I believe this is something that the WBA is looking into as well. So, um, yeah. But in terms of the commission, I believe, yes, Bob Bennett was there um, looking over the footage, but I believe there's also, um, I've been told, a board of about five other people who will review this decision. Uh, so it won't be just solely down to Bob Bennett. Um, and also, I believe we also have more footage um, from different camera angles than what they saw on the night. And I've seen some of the footage that wasn't shown on TV and the footage couldn't be any more clear. There's some great footage which shows Franco's eye perfectly fine, uh, a jab landing, and then his eye immediately swelling up afterwards. So the footage we have is extremely clear. And until I saw that, I, I was sort of sort of thought what, what you were saying, that they've already looked at it. They're going to stick to their guns. But... The footage I've seen now, I will be shocked if they don't overturn it because it can't be any more clear. Wow, okay. Well, that certainly is very interesting to learn. Um, now, obviously, Andrew, in the first fight, you, you had the rematch clause. Um, because of the way the second fight ended, and forgive me for not knowing this, but does that mean now that you no longer have Franco pinned under a contract and he's kind of free to do whatever he wants from this point onwards? Um, I believe as part of our first fight, um, Top Rank have the options on Franco's next two fights after that, um, our first encounter. So he still has one more fight on his Top Rank contract. And Bob Harum has told us that he's going to make sure that fight is against me and no one else. Excellent, excellent news. And again, we're talking about, or we're hearing about it being... Uh, held in Australia, perhaps part of a brilliant card with the likes of George Cambosos on it and the rest of the guys. Um, how different does this fight play out, you know, in Australia, where Franco has to travel to your backyard? Yeah, that's right. That's that's something that we've been speaking about with Bob Arum, and and that's just yeah, um, it'd be a dream come true if we can bring this fight to Australia um, and in front of. You know, a, a packed crowd. We can have crowds in Australia now, and 
Um, we have some big stadiums there where we can fill, you know, roughly 50,000 people in an arena, which has been done before. And yeah, to have this fight in Australia in front of all my friends and family and everyone who supported me over the years, it would just to be a dream come true and, and make everything that we've been through these last few weeks all worth it. So fingers crossed we can make it happen. I could actually hear you smile when I brought that up, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it'll be pretty special if we can do that and have this in Australia. So I really hope we can make it happen. And, and yeah, the, there's a possibility, as you mentioned, of, of having it on the same card as TFMO Lopez and George Cambosis. And possibly my, my twin brother Jason also fighting a big fight, um, hopefully for a world title as well. Um, and that would just be massive if we, can, if we can put that sort of card on in Australia. Yeah, for sure. And um, coming down to my real last question, Andrew, um, obviously, again, it's still a bit early yet. You're waiting on a verdict, a final verdict. You're waiting on fight news, perhaps, for the third fight. Uh, when are we likely to hear something a bit more concrete? Um, I really don't know how long this whole appeal process is going to take or anything like that. Um, but the date we're, we're aiming for at the moment is April to have this fight in Australia. Um, and hopefully in the next few weeks we can, we can start to, to move forward with this and to, to lock in a date and, and get you know some answers on whether the Cambosis TFMO fight is going to happen um, even if that fight doesn't happen, we still are, are going to look at having this fight in Australia with myself and my brother Jason headlining the show. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we can start to get some answers and get things moving forward in the coming weeks. But at the moment, my focus is on a third fight with Franco um, sometime around April. Excellent stuff. Excellent stuff. And just finally, Andrew, if you've got any closing words just to your supporters over here, like you said, millions of people around the world are outraged that you're not a world champion right now. Everyone's on your side. Uh, it doesn't matter which nationality, where the hell they're from. A lot of guys over here are outraged. What's your message to those guys that have stuck behind you, um, you know, following this unfair, uh, in many people's eyes, decision? What's, what's come of it? Yeah, nah. Thank you so much to everyone for your support. I have had a lot of messages from people in the UK um, reaching out to me and showing their support and, and telling me to keep my head up and that I'm the real champion. So that makes things a little bit easier and I really appreciate it. So thank you. Absolutely. Listen, Andrew, it's always great speaking with you, mate. We'll, we'll, we'll keep our eyes peeled for some news real soon. I really hope that the decision you know, gets, gets overturned and you become champion again. It is what you deserve. Thank you for your time, and we'll catch up again soon, I'm sure. Uh, thank you, mate. Appreciate you having me on. Good chatting. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the preview part. We're going to start here at the H Arena tomorrow night in Nantes uh, in France. Over here, a heavyweight fight over 10 rounds between Olympic gold medalist Tony Yoka and Christian Hammer, the guy that was supposed to be taking on Dave Allen, of course, before Hammer pulled out with coronavirus. Then Lovejoy stepped in, and then that fight didn't happen because Don King put a stop to it. Then Dave Allen retired. Anyway, he's back. He's back in... France against Tony Yoka. Um, moving out now to Thailand at the City Hall ground in Nakhon Sawan. This one's over 12 rounds for the WBC minimum weight world title. We get to see Cheya von Moontry, 54-0, and 0, putting that... I mean, it's not even about the WBC title anymore. It's more about the undefeated uh, record, 54-0, and 0, in a 12-rounder against Panya... Prada Bizri, who is 34 and 1 in his own right. Um, again, that one's tomorrow night as well. Also, tomorrow night at the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Hollywood, Florida, USA. Um, talking of Olympic gold medalists, we get to see Daniel Yelusinov, 9 and 0. He takes on former unified world champion Julius Indongo. 23 and 2. That's a brilliant fight, that, for the vacant IBF intercontinental welterweight title. Um, I really like that fight. I don't want to see people knocking it if 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 Yelusinov blows Indongo out, because Indongo, I don't care what anyone says, he's had a couple of um, strange performances, you know, but he's only lost two. Regis Progre and Terence Crawford. Now, if you're losing to both of those guys, fair enough, by early stoppage, but there's no shame in that. Those guys are tremendous fighters, and um, 
This is a big step up for Yelusinov. He hasn't looked fantastic since turning pro. This is a really, really big step up, actually. Um, all the best to both guys in that one. May the best man win. Also, really and truly, I'm going to just jump straight to the main event because that's the, the next kind of big fight on the card. Daniel Jacobs, 36-3. and three. No title on the line here. Um, he doesn't have a belt anymore, I don't think. He takes on over 12 rounds. There's bad blood there. Um, Gabe Rosado, 25-12 and 12 with a draw. Not overly looking forward to it. I've said it before. I think Gabe Rosado should retire man he's he's just too tough for his own good he's he's been in you know he brings it he brings the action he's uh don't even want to say he's exciting too much really but yeah he's a guy that has just you know never had it easy man this guy has probably had the toughest path you know he's one of those guys that fights all the contenders you know the guys that that can bang the guys that can box he's faced every single style and um I just feel sorry for him, really. I hope he's got enough money to not need to box, because, yeah, it's, it's dangerous for him. Um, do you want to give a say on that one? You know enough about those two guys, Eddie. Yeah, I mean, with uh, Gabe, I mean, like, I've seen him, you know, from earlier in his career <clears throat> when, you know, he was on his way up and, you know, fighting at different different uh, local places. and sadly, Seeing that he had some promise, he had some pop, and he was just tough. You know, and, and and then, you know, over the course of his career, you know, he, he's been in war after war, fought guy after guy who was, you know, near the top. And it's just after a while, it gets to be a little bit long, you know, a little bit too long in the tooth where he's taking too much punishment. You know what I mean? And sometimes these guys are too tough for their own good and they need someone to kind of step in and say, look, man, I mean, you did great. You ain't got nothing to be ashamed of. Your career, you didn't. You know, whether you want a title or not doesn't really matter. You've been, you know, in, in, in the conversation of fights of the year. You've been you've been that guy. You've been there. You've been out there. You've done enough. You know what I mean? There's no point if you're good with money. And even if you're not, it's about, you know, your kids and your family and your friends and everything and being able to talk when you get to be in your 50s and you're in, the, in your uh, 40, late 40s, early 50s and all of that. And being able to just enjoy the rest of your life. You know what I mean? That's really going to be something that he's going to want you know, once he's done. And I think right now, I mean, you know, especially after this fight, this should be, this should be his farewell tour thing. You know what I mean? Get a, get a, get a last one in. This is a good opportunity with a big name guy. Now, if you win, that's one thing, but if you go out and you go out ugly, then it's time to really think about hanging them up. Yeah. I hope he doesn't go out ugly. Um, you know, yeah. The last time he got knocked out was by um, David Lemieux back in 2014. And, um, you know, since then, by the way, his record is... He's got three, four wins and... Um, he's got four wins and one, two, three... Three losses and a draw. Okay. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, he... Uh, He's going to be 35 in January. Yeah, I think, you know, whatever. All the best to him. Uh, moving out now to the Church House in Westminster, London, United Kingdom. Again, this one not on pay-per-view. It's going to be on ESPN Plus out in the States if you're, if you're watching it out there. And it'll be on BT Sport over here in the UK. Um, starting with the undercard, the undefeated heavyweight David Adelaide, 3-0. and He's in a six-rounder against Danny Whittaker. You've got Jack Massey, 16-1, and in an eight-rounder against Muhammad Ali Bayat Farid, who's 16-1 and with a draw. Uh, Jack Catterall, the guy that is in the mandatory position to take on Jose Ramirez for his world title, he obviously agreed to step aside for some kind of fee or whatever. He's 25-0. and He's in a 10-rounder against... Abderazak Huya, who's 14-2, and two, a bit of a tick-over fight there, he should win that easy. Hamza Shiraz, 11-0, and 0. this one's for the uh, for the WBO European Super Welterweight title. He takes on Guido Pito, who's 26-7 and 7 with two draws. But the main event, the, uh, the most interesting fight on the card by a mile. I didn't know there was this many belts on the line as well. There's actually five titles on the line here. We've got... The British heavyweight title, the Commonwealth heavyweight title, the vacant EBU European heavyweight title, the WBO international belt, and the WBC silver 
title. Um, the undefeated Daniel Dubois, 15 and 0 against Joe Joyce, the undefeated 11 and 0 Olympic silver medalist. Over 12 rounds here. Um, it's a brilliant fight, Eddie. And you know, a lot of people over here are quite happy that we are um, finally getting it because it was supposed to. It wasn't really supposed to take place, but. In fact, I think it was supposed to take place. When it was originally announced, it was supposed to take place. Of course it was. Then it got pushed back because of Corona. Then I think it got pushed back again. And Frank Warren pretty much said, this fight can't happen without crowds. And then we knew that we're not going to get any crowds. It's as simple as that. Then it was going to be, this fight can't happen unless it's on pay-per-view because this, you know, we're losing that revenue that, that the tickets bring in. And then it ended up somehow going ahead with no fans and no pay-per-view. So people are really, people should be really happy about that one. And I certainly am. But anyway, forget about all that stuff. Let's talk about the fight. Um, the, the general consensus is Dubois early or Joe Joyce perhaps with a late stoppage or a points win. How do you see that one going down? I think both both guys. Um, this is going to be like <laughs> watching <laughs> Godzilla and King Kong and all that crap. They're two big, big, uh, heavy guys, heavy shots. You know, uh, I don't not necessarily predictable, but you know, interesting fighters in the, you know in their own right. But it's. Uh, old school, new school kind of, kind of blend, you know what I'm saying? With, um, you know, these guys being big and basic, but with a lot of amateur background, well, especially with Joe Joyce and uh, decent skills for, for their size. So that part, it makes it a bit interesting. And then the contrast with, oh, most people think the wire early and Joe Joyce late could be the exact opposite. You know, you know, you know, with boxing, you, you know, it's, it's kind of, you never know what, what to expect. Um, I'm going to agree with that. I mean, I haven't seen much of either, but what I have seen, Dubois definitely looks to be the aggressor, aggression, aggressor most times, and, you know, and on the front foot, mostly throwing a lot of heavy shots. You know, box is a bit, you know, long range shots, but definitely uh, uh, on the gas. And Joe Joyce is obviously a little bit more, you know, schooled, even though he doesn't honestly to, to you know, to me and, you know, aesthetically, he doesn't necessarily em- like look so impressive with his skills, but you know, he got a silver medal. He's obviously been good enough to win all of the fights he's had. Of course, that doesn't necessarily mean anything at this point in his career, but he's still able to do what he needs to do to win. And he's a winner at this point. He showed that in the amateur. So uh, with that background, he would have to lean toward um, that, in my opinion. I don't really know much about Dubois' amateur background or just, you know, him in general. You know, aside from what he's already, what he's, what he's done as a fighter in these, you know, last few years, but like I said, in that, just looking at the background and who's more schooled, and I'm always a big uh, believer in skills and, and planning and understanding, and I think that's what Joe Joyce has on his side. But it don't mean nothing when somebody hits you in the mouth. So if he hits him in the mouth and hurts him and puts him down, it could be a quick, quick exit. But as it as it stands, I, I, I'm. The way I'm looking at it, it's like I said, from a strategic standpoint, if Joe Joyce has a good enough plan in place, he could, uh, I think he could take him in the deep water. Yeah, and that's pretty much what Joe Joyce has said to Daniel Dubois face-to-face. They did some kind of sit-down, kind of like, uh, you know, whatever they used to call it. What, what was that show called that Max Kellerman used to do for HBO? It was like a face-off, face-off yeah, they said yeah. face-off. Yeah, so it's something like that, but... You know, Dubois didn't have a real extensive um, amateur background. You know, he's 15-0 and 0 as a pro with 14 KOs. Mm-hmm. His notable wins came against... Um, I'm going to throw this one in there. Not that it's a notable win, but, you know, he, he got in there with Dorian Darch in one of those wins. Um, mm-hmm. A guy you know well. He, he, he stopped mm-hmm. Tom Little. Uh, the only man to take him the distance was Kevin Kingpin Johnson. Um <laughs> Oh, yeah, uh, he knocked out Nathan Gorman. That was a good one. I remember Tyson Fury being, uh, you know, massively um, favoring Gorman in that fight, and yeah, he just couldn't get going. Um, and since then, he hasn't really sort of boxed any great names. I mean, he's boxed this guy called Ebenezer Tete. He was nineteen and zero from uh, mm-hmm. from Ghana. You know, he got he, he stopped him, and that was that. Um, he knocked out a guy from Japan who was twenty one and one. 
Um, I was there for that one. He knocked out a guy from um, from from the Netherlands who was 18 and one. But these guys weren't really known. But Joe Joyce's pro uh, pro resume, anyway, is so much more um, impressive. You know, his his debut, he beat Ian Lewis, and I, I was there for that. Um, he beat yeah. Donny Palmer, a guy who wasn't really that great, but I think he was six foot ten from Massachusetts, and um, it took him one round to get rid of him. He was talking mad mad smack and stuff in the build up he, he, he beat uh, Lemroy Thomas stopped him early he beat um, Iago Kiladze he beat uh, Joe Hanks another American in one round you know Joe Hanks yeah I know Joe yeah definitely he came out to camp with us over uh, me and Tyson well me and Tyson <laughs> when Peter and Tyson and all of us were over in, uh, in, uh, in Bolton wow. he came over there you know what's crazy about Joe Hanks is he has boxing ability and you know everybody you know tries to, you know, take it away by saying, oh, he doesn't have no heart. He doesn't have this and that. you got to have heart to get in the ring. But in order to be great, you've got to go places you're not willing to go, and it just seems like that's been Joe Hanks' issue as a pro. Yeah. Joe Joe Hanks knocked out um, Cliff Kowser. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Tyson. You know, he was like a rep. He looked like him a lot. And then they said he had the same dad and all. They was trying to pull that old thing out of, man, whatever. <laughs> but yeah, he uh, <laughs> he he knocked out Cliff Cowser. He knocked out Marcus Rody in a round as well. Um, my man Marcus Rody like that. <laughs> yeah, but then yeah, since then I mean he lost to Andy Ruiz. That was where he lost his O, and um, and then he lost to Derek Rossi in the very next fight after that. And um, uh, since then, he got two wins, and he came back and got stopped in a round against Joe Joyce, like I say. Um, after that, Joe Joyce went on to knock out Bermain Stavern. Um, after that, he went on to knock out Alexander Ustinov. The only man to take him the distance was Brian Jennings in the fight after that. And um, yeah, he, huh? he fought B1. I didn't realize he fought B1. Huh? What? What am I? What am I saying? How did I not know that? Yeah, um, July last year, 2019. How did I, how did I forget about that? Do you know what? Like, I, I forgot about it as well. Um, not not right now, but I, I forgot about it in the past because I actually saw BY uh, in October last year. And I went up to him and I said, oh, man, you know, when are you fighting next, man? Like, it's been a while. And he was like, I fought here like three months ago. <laughs> and I was like, against who? <laughs> and he was like, against Joe Joyce. I was like, oh yeah, I completely put like literally. I said it to his face. I forgot he even had a fight with with uh, with yeah. Joe Joyce. So yeah, I forgive you, man. <laughs> like, so, I, I mean, I feel I feel kind of bad. Like what happened? I can't even remember what happened. Uh, like I remember seeing parts of it, but I can't. I mean, like well, somebody showed me a video. Um. I don't know, there was, I think B.Y. hurt Joe Joyce with a body shot early on in the fight, if I remember correctly, but Joe Joyce ended up winning, you know, quite well. There was a few different scorecards. He won unanimously, but Jennings yeah. had a point deducted in the 10th round for a low blow. Um, 115-112, 118-109, 117-110, so, you know. 115-112. I thought they were going to be like, oh, kind of fairly close, but damn, guess not. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, and then he's, his last fight, um, uh, Joe Joyce, he's coming off a knockout win against Michael Wallish, this German heavyweight. But, yeah, he's got the far superior resume. He's got the far superior amateur background. He's he's really mixed it in the amateurs, you know. He's boxed everyone in the amateurs, you know, like you sick, everyone in the amateurs. And, um, you know, the only thing that kind of bothers me is he is 35 and Daniel is only 23. Obviously, the youth is so much on Daniel's side. But, um, yeah. yeah, it's going to be an interesting fight. I keep changing, chopping and changing. I keep... Initially, I thought that Joe Joyce would win. Then, Joe Joyce didn't really impress me in his last fight. He just looked really slow. And I thought, nah, man, Dubois is going to be too active, too quick. You know, he's going to catch him early. But I don't know. I've kind of, I've kind of changed my mind again because um, I'm not sure, man. It's, it's, it's tough. It's tough. It's, it's been, it's been long enough for me to kind of forget Joe Joyce's last outing. Really, that's what's happened. But Dubois is trying to get in his head. Um, 
Joe Joyce, I've heard, I've never really seen him take a shot since turning pro, but I've heard he's got an amazing chin. So it'd be interesting mm. to see what happens because, you know, he's been saying to Daniel, you haven't been hit back yet, and to a degree, he's kind of right. So yeah. really looking forward yeah. to it. But, you know, that's that. Um, I, I I don't even know who I think is going to win. It's it's just a, it's a toss-up. It's a 50-50 fight. Hopefully the winner goes on and hopefully the loser gets rebuilt quickly because it's not over for the yeah. loser. Uh, moving out now. Mm-hmm. Sorry, go on. Yeah. No, no, no. That's all right. All right. Cool. All, all, all I was going to say was, in a fight like this that happens somewhat early in their careers. I mean, Joe Joyce being thirty-five, but still kind of early in his uh, ascension. Um, the good thing about this is, if if moved properly afterwards, it could be just a blemish that happened early, and they can improve and then maybe see each other later as top top dogs in the game. But I, I don't dislike this kind of thing, you know what I mean. But if it, but undefeated records are so important, so sometimes it could be a little bit, a little bit rocky after it at first. But if you really, really turn it on and you beat some name guys as you get back into the good graces of the people, you never know. You can, you can, you can actually turn out to be better. We shall see. But um, yeah, another factor is that Joe Joyce's trainer, who hasn't been with him for, he definitely wasn't with him for his last fight, and I'm not sure he was with him for the fight before that, but Ishmael Salas, the Cuban, he's managed to get himself over here now. The reason why he wasn't there last time out is because of coronavirus, stopping travel mm-hmm. and stuff like that, but he's he's with him now, so that's a big asset. Um, moving out now to the Staples Center in Los Angeles, California, I'm going to start with the undercard uh, well, <laughs> I'm actually not planning on talking about the main event whatsoever, but I'm gonna I'm gonna just go over the undercard. You've got um, Badu Jack, 23 and three. He's in there against the undefeated Blake McKernan, who's 13 and oh, that's over eight rounds there. Um, you've got Rashad Coulter. Uh, Rashad Coulter I need to check out his record actually, because um, I've known about this for 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 a few weeks, but no one knew. He's uh, oh he's an MMA fighter apparently oh god mm. I don't I don't know nothing about MMA at all but um anyway he was supposed to be taking on Vidal Riley who is a guy that is um he trained KSI for one of those YouTube fights or something and since then he's kind of like been hanging around in the Mayweather gym he's an undefeated pro himself but he started his own YouTube channel and stuff like that you know he's not done anything as a pro really but He's kind of semi-famous now with kids on YouTube and stuff. So he was supposed to be on the card against this guy, Rashad Coulter. But anyway, he has been pulled off the card. And in steps, our man, Hassim Rackman Jr. to take his place. So Rackman Jr. 9-0 and against um, Rashad Coulter, who's 4-0. and That one is over six rounds there. Uh, Coulter, 4-0, and three KOs. He is... Um, 30 he is 39 tomorrow wow, wow. i believe yeah f- yeah 39 tomorrow that is crazy um but yeah anyway whatever moving on to the other fights you've got jake paul one and oh he's in against nathaniel robinson who i believe is is he some f- american football player or something eddie oh he's he's I didn't even know that was still happening. Yeah, yeah. He's fighting Nate Robinson. Oh, my God. Nate Robinson was a former NBA player. Oh, okay. NBA, legitimate. He, like, won a dunk contest, like, three times. He's um he's a really good player, like, talented, extremely athletic. He's only 5'10". 5'9". Five, 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 yeah, yeah. 5'9", five, five, but had, like, a 44, 43-inch vertical or 45-inch vertical or something like that. He's real athletic. And he's tough, like he in, in, in on the court, like you you can see he intimidated certain people with his with his just the, his his demonstrative attitude. But um, he's funny, but he is an athlete. So I mean, I don't know if he's ever boxed before. Uh, obviously, he's doing it now. Yeah, he's fighting but I don't YouTuber. Know. I mean, you know. Yeah, but to be honest, and guess what? They're fight. Even though this guy is um, Nate Robinson, five nine, he's uh, he's fighting at cruiserweight for this one. See what I mean? I mean, the like, guy is fighting six one, you know. Right, right, right. But I mean, Nate <laughs> is different. 
the sport is totally different, but he's used to seeing big people and being in front of and tussling. <laughs> yeah, that's gonna he, help him. <laughs> way taller than him, man. Like six six, will be guarding him. Six four, will be guarding him all the time. So it's totally different, though. Yeah. And one thing is from from uh, basketball, but you know I love basketball and I would love to see Nate Robinson do well in here. But when I look at this guy Jake Paul, he is as much as he's only a YouTuber it's and all good. this stuff. It's good. Know, He's not bad. Like, he's not bad. Like, I'm not going to hate. Even the other guy, KSI, when they fought, it didn't even look that bad. Like, it actually looked a little bit, like, okay. Like, they he, really... This guy didn't fight K- KSI. Though. This guy's brother fought KSI. What? Yeah, this guy who's fighting here, he... uh, he, His brother had the fight with KSI and his brother had quite a good jab actually but he lost the fight controversially that's his older brother this guy's older brother they're both YouTubers what is his name now what's the other one the, the, his older brother is Logan Paul oh god shoot me down for knowing this <laughs> nah you know what you're right you're absolutely right and I'm sitting there thinking like damn he didn't actually look bad but I mean I've seen this guy in the back I'm like hey, yeah he does yeah, he, he, he actually Looks, he looks pretty good. This this Jake boy, he's the younger brother, and he's been yeah. training with. Um, oh my god, I think he's been training with. Um, he's he's been doing like one to one with. Um, I seen him somebody. I can't remember who. What's that guy? Um, uh, Bj Flores, I think, has been training him. Oh, he oh, Bj been training. Oh, I believe. Oh, okay, because I seen something when he was training with someone. Yeah, and I can't remember. I didn't, I couldn't remember who it was, but now. Now I don't even think I even knew who it was exactly, but I knew both of those guys, his brother too, as well as the other guy KSI. Both of them were, uh, all of them were were trained, you know, training with. You know, I'm pretty sure guys who knew what the hell they were doing. So that's why they do have some kind of understanding of the sport. Except though, I mean, it takes a long time. They couldn't get in there with a real elite guy who, really, even a guy who's you know, like a, a guy a losing record as a pro, but has experience as an amateur and all that. It would still kind of be unfair than fighting them, but they still don't look bad. So I'm not, I'm not going to take it over, you know, take, take, take their, you know, credibility away by saying, Oh, they're YouTubers. I wouldn't do that. But the fact is it kind of sucks seeing somebody get those kind of opportunities to make that kind of money. But I kind of, I also understand why it's taking place and why it happens because they're able to generate, fans to watch so if you got a million followers on youtube and a whole bunch of other things then trust me you're gonna you're gonna draw a crowd so that's good happy for him yeah um if you're still listening through our about 10 minute chat about these youtubers then uh i thank you so much you must really like us um <laughs> but, uh, yeah moving uh i don't really want to talk about the the, the main event eddie but um I don't know uh, if you want to say some words because these guys, I'm sure, were you know borderline heroes of yours, perhaps. I mean, yeah. I, keep it short because this is. I mean, well, damn. <laughs> I'm, a simple, I'm gonna keep it real short, but I mean, it's a simple. To me, it's a simple thing. I mean, two all-time greats. I've um, heard. Wait, let me just interrupt and say I've heard because obviously it's an exhibition. I've heard that they you, you're not allowed to knock the other person down. I mean, I don't know how they're gonna stop that from happening, but. Um, no knockdowns. Yeah, no, no yeah, knockdowns, no knockouts. Um, I've heard that there's not going to be judges officially there, but there's going to be judges watching it, I think, at home, scoring it. And you'd never believe the three judges that um, that they've, that the WBC, because the WBC have come out and they've actually put some kind of belt on the line. Yeah, I, mean, I know that's, um, mm-hmm. it's, I was going to say it's unbelievable, but it's not. It's, it's very believable. But, um, mm-hmm. Yeah, they've got three ex fighters judging on the panel for this fight here. Do you know who they've picked? It's the most randomest lineup ever. Three ex fighters? Three ex fighters. I, I couldn't even imagine who. Okay. Three ex fighters older, like way back, or. No, I'll just tell them to you because you're never going to guess this trio. It's really oh. weird. So you've got Vinny Pazienza. Okay. Who, okay. who I said it before, my interview with him, when, when I had him on, um, it, it's the best interview I've ever done and will ever do. That is my favorite interview ever with Vinny Pazienza. He is one of the one of the three judges. The other judge, 
uh, Christy Martin, and the other judge, oh. Chad Dawson. What a weird trio. Yo, I'm going to tell you this. I was thinking it was going to be one was a female. Yeah. <laughs> I swear, I don't know why. Because of the way you made it seem. You see, it was, was going to be like so kind of random how they were picked in so many different you know genres of, of what well, genres so many different um style uh, styles or, or sex i thought it, it could be anybody but yeah that's anyway sorry sorry to cut you off what you what were you saying uh i know that the uh, you're not going to probably have known this but i've looked at the the uh the betting odds and mike tyson is a huge favorite over roy jones well you know why that is you know, I know it's because of the it, hype, but I mean, Roy Jones was active way sooner than Tyson was. You know, if they, look, this is if there's really no knockouts and all that crap and all that stuff like they're saying, then okay, I'm definitely going Roy. But even then, you gotta be, you can't be sure about because I just don't. Even though Roy's a uh, sharp puncher, and even like you said, he's been active. It's just it's hard for me to believe that he's gonna be able to keep Mike off him. You understand what I'm saying? Like, it isn't like Mike was a real big, slow heavyweight. Mike was explosive and fast and, and aggressive. It was. If you, yeah, I mean, but the, the temperament's still there. You know what I'm saying? He's still, if, if he can move even a little bit, just even enough to get in range, if he, the whole no knockouts thing might not even be something that they can control. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm just being yeah. This is my this is my thing. If Roy can keep away and keep him at bay, then yeah, Roy can win an easy decision. I, you know, don't don't make it seem like that's not possible because Roy is the is is the boxer that most fighters want to be like. You know what I mean? They want to be able to do what he was able to do in his career. But I mean, those are, those years are long past us now. You know what I'm saying? Long past him. So just like, of course, for Mike Tyson too. But if we're talking about standing in front and throwing punches. And all it needs, all it takes is just one. Come on, man. It's a scary thing to think of Roy Jones in there with a Mike Tyson. Even in his prime, even both of them prime for prime, that's dangerous. Very dangerous. Yeah. Um, I think it's over eight two-minute rounds as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Quickest main event of all time right there. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I've heard all sorts of things because I know actually Coach Ant put out some kind of post and he said like he's heard that these are going to be the rules and I, I read some of them but uh, I don't know if it's 100% sure but he said about eight two-minute rounds and 12-ounce gloves with no head guard, I believe, as well. So hmm. we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Because even with a head gear, it's still dangerous in there. But 12 ounce gloves is a little. Look, soon enough, 12 ounce gloves is going to be a reality in boxing. It's going to start happening. You know what I mean? Because, you know, any more deaths, any more severe injuries, any more people, you know, being in uh, wheelchairs and stuff like that for, for long periods of time. And they're going to start to try to find ways to keep athletes safer and design gloves and make glove sizes a little bit you know, less, less dangerous, but I mean, they're already doing stuff like that. The amateurs, I mean, well, they've already had 12s and 10s versus the eights and tw- uh, eights and 10s they do in the pros. So, I mean, this is just, you know, uh, you gotta, you know, world is not as it was in years past. Now it's becoming a little bit more um, politically correct and less dangerous. So, well, at least they're trying to be less dangerous, but it's not working out everywhere. But, you know, in the sports world, this is where they're headed because they don't want to be responsible for, you know, these deaths and these and these severe injuries and things. So it's good that they're going to be some of the first guys. Well, I don't want to say the first guys. I'm pretty sure they had other exhibition fights that had gloves and of similar sizes or, you know, whatever the case. But it's good that they're going to be using them because it keeps them a bit safer. And like I said, the size difference between the two, which is really non-existent at this point as far as I know. But just what they're used to and what they've been involved in. You know, Mike's been a heavyweight, his, you know, his whole career. And um, Roy obviously was 175 and went up to heavyweight late, but really was just blown up from 175. So um, I think it's a good situation. And um, I'm just, I'm looking forward to, there's excitement behind it because it's two legends, but yeah, it'll be interesting uh, to say the least. Yeah, we shall see. Um I'm definitely not going to... It's pay-per-view over here. It's pay-per-view over there. I'm definitely not going to pay for it, but 
I might just have to see <laughs> how Tyson looks. I'll have to find a stream somewhere, but I can't bring myself <laughs> to pay for it. But um, I mean, go on. No, I, I agree. I agree. It's like one of those things, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's. Uh, it's like I don't want to. I don't want to watch it, but I can't be the only boxing podcast that doesn't watch it. You know. Right. Right. You don't want to be that guy. So you got to find a way to watch it, man. Even if you had a pony up the dump. <laughs> you got to figure it out. Joey. I'll figure it out somehow. But anyway, the final card to preview. It takes place next Wednesday, December the 2nd. This year has just gone so quick. But um, yeah, December the 2nd. Um, by the time we do the show next week, this card would have already took place. So here we are previewing it. Um, on the undercard, we get to see a brilliant 50-50 fight between two undefeated fighters. Daniel Egbonike, 6-0 and in a 10-rounder against Harlem Eubank, who's 10-0. and um, We also get to see the featherweight golden contract finals between Jazza Dickens, 29-3, and friend of the show. He's in a 10-rounder against Ryan Walsh. Who is twenty six and two with two draws? May the best man win. There, actually, I hope Jazza wins that one. He's a friend of the show. I'd like to see him win. And the other kind of co-main event is for the WBO European Light Heavyweight Title. It's the Light Heavyweight um, Golden Contract Finals. We get to see Rickards Bolotniks seventeen and five with a draw, coming off that win over Josea Burton. He takes on Serge Michel, who is eleven and. One coming off the win over um I always forget this guy's name, man. Damn, always got his face in my head. You know, I know everyone he fought. I, oh god, I forgot the guy's name. I always do this with this same guy. He's like my boogeyman for forgetting stuff. Um <laughs> Oh gosh. What a silly way to end. Um Liam Comroy. So yeah, got there in the end. But um, yeah, anyway, that's it for the previewing. Like I say, we did the reviewing, we did the news, we did the previewing, we did Eddie's trivia question. Uh, we, we're going to probably do the lockdown knockdown, I'm guessing, next week. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a great show once again. Uh, we had, of course, the, the sole guest as well, I forgot to mention, Andrew Maloney. And um, yeah, just before I wrap the show up, um, it's, it's time to say thank you once again to you, Eddie, for participating and bailing me out once again throughout this crazy period in all of our lives. And um, I want to ask you a question. I'll put you on the spot a tiny bit here. Right now, yeah. with the way you're feeling now, with whatever's going on in your life now, will mm -hmm. we see you back in a ring, gut feeling, in 2021? Honestly, I... You know, talking to a few people and, you know, trying to make some adjustments to, to what's going on and, and try to figure out where I can go to get some warm-up fights. I mean, there's a good, good, good possibility that that can happen. I actually want it to happen, but obviously uh, coronavirus is not uh, <laughs> cooperating all the time. And, you know, just in general, I'm getting older and I don't I don't want to waste time. So. But I also don't want to get in there and not be 100% ready and, 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 and focused and ready and, and determined to do what's necessary to be the best possible fighter I can be. So, you know, it's either all or nothing. And um, I got to make sure that I'm ready, really ready for that. So we'll see. Hopefully it will be soon. Okay, well, there we have it. And like I say, Eddie, thanks once again for being with me for this show. It's always a pleasure having you on. It is very much our podcast these days. But anyway, that's it. And I'm going to sign out with the, the outro in just a few seconds. Okay, and this wraps up episode 267 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A massive thank you to our sole guest on this week's podcast, the former WBA Super Flyweight World Champion, Andrew Maloney. The biggest thanks, as ever, though, goes out to you, the listeners. Thank you once again for tuning into this week's podcast. There has been one piece of news break whilst we've been recording the show, and it's a negative piece of news, sadly. It's that Ishmael 
Salas, the trainer of Joe Joyce, will now not be in the corner, as after he arrived in the UK um, on fight week, he tested positive for coronavirus, so the fight will still go ahead, that's the that's the important bit, but he won't be with Joe Joyce in the corner, um, he'll be absent, as he pretty much was for all of camp anyway, uh, hopefully it doesn't affect Big Joe Joyce going into the fight too much, but that's about everything from myself, remember if you get the time to leave us a review on iTunes, please do so, remember to tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend about the podcast, enjoy your weekends people, stay safe and we shall see you all again next week.